Well, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the talk with a very long name. Designing a design system for module, modular modules and building a team to build it. My name is Josiah McCann. Joining me on stage are Marianne Epstein and Josh Trout. Josh and I are representing the core web development team, and Marianne is here representing the UX design team at USA Today. First, I want to start off by saying thank you, Polymer team, for having us out to speak again. Last year was a really, really fun year, very, very practical talks, and I'm really excited about the talks tomorrow and the rest of the talks today. It's been a great conference so far. So I want to share a little bit about the USA Today network and what we're all about. And, and we're all about making communities stronger. Uh, and we do that, and to, and to do that, we have to inform them, equip them, and empower them, fostering deep and vital connections between members of our community and the world around them. And we connect these communities all together through our national brand, USA Today, and our 109 local media organizations, merging our national voice with the local communities. As an award-winning news organization and a modern media company, our 500-plus digital products reach 110 readers every single month. We reach 43% of the internet population with our content, resulting in 1.5 billion page views every month. And as you can imagine, this level of scale and fragmentation between so many websites has its challenges. And today we want to share our success as a dev and a design team, focusing on very practical points you can immediately walk away with and apply to any size team or project. So to give you a little bit of context of, you know, here's what we've been up to since we last spoke. A year ago, we launched our new Polymer-based web framework. We're test driving it with a few, we test drove it with a few different microsites. We talked about one last summit, our Olympics coverage, our data-driven Olympics coverage. And after that, we launched our continuous coverage of the election, all converging on election night, the biggest news night of the year, where the framework made its big stand, taking on heavy amounts of traffic. And the entire process, it was a great way to see how much faster and more efficient we could build on this new framework, while also identifying areas that needed to be improved. And at the beginning of this year, we began replatforming our current sites onto this framework and doing a complete redesign at the same time. Right now, usatoday.com on mobile devices is completely powered by this new Polymer web framework. Part of this new framework is we want to figure out, can we build quickly? Can we build more efficiently? And it really, really worked for us. And, but this new approach that we took, this module everywhere approach, uh, is key to our success in building for a large news organization with many developers scattered all over the nation. So this, is a, this approach, it's adopting a module way of thinking, and web components on the client are front and center, or Polymer-based approach, but also, not just our client, but our servers, we have server-side modulization through microservice, through a microservice ecosystem. This modules everywhere approach is very decoupled, allowing for maximum component reuse across not just our team, but through any of our web developers spread across the entire network reducing the cost of experimentation, maximizing shared code use across each and every property. And to support this development philosophy, design had to be on board and think modularly as well. And here to talk about our new design system that supports this framework is Marianne. Okay. 
Hi, everyone. As Josiah said, our design team has spent the past year working on a new modular design system. And today, I'm going to talk about what a big change this was for us, as well as what worked well for our design and dev teams in case your teams might be approaching sort of similar challenges. Heading into our redesign last spring, we had separate desktop and mobile sites. And we'd been adding new things to them for a couple of years. And over time, our designs had veered off in many different directions. Here you can see a story coming into our desktop site, and that same story also coming into our mobile site. And they look very different from one another. And if you were to hide the logo at the top, you might even think that these came from two different publications. And these differences were causing problems for our business. Our journalists couldn't predict how their stories were going to look, which was very frustrating for them. And from analytics, we knew that our readers weren't as happy as they could be either. And because these same sites were being sent to 100 different newsrooms, our designs were frustrating a lot of people every day, which on the UX team is the opposite of what you want. So there were some good reasons behind everything looking so different at this point. First, a lot of things had changed since these sites were built, reader habits, our storytelling in response to those, um, and our scale. We had grown a lot as a news network in the past few years. Meanwhile, we were not set up well for all of this change. We didn't have a style guide. So whenever we needed something new, which was pretty much all of the time, we would do our best to make it match. But more often than not, we would have to design it from scratch. So we wanted to really understand our problems before diving into a redesign. So we shadowed our journalists to find out what they really needed from our sites. And then we took inventory. So we screen capped every page of our websites to understand how we were currently meeting the journalists' needs. And what we found were just hundreds and hundreds of single-use, one-off experiences. So here's a specific example to show you what was happening. We are a news organization, so one of the most important things we do is promote stories to help readers find things that they're interested in. And we call these story promos. And at the time of our inventory, we found this. So this is 12 versions of a very similar looking story promo. But each one of these could only be used in a specific place. So this one only ever showed up on home pages. And this one only ever on blog pages. This one only ever appeared on mobile article pages. And this one only in desktop search results. And on and on for all of these. And if you look at these more closely, almost every style here is unique. So every headline has a slightly different font treatment. Even the hex values of all of these grays, they're all different. So not only had this same thing been designed 12 times, it had also been dev'd 12 times. And this was just one example. So we saw the same sort of duplication and variation happening for our video promos, our share tools, pretty much everything else on our site. So to step back for a second, as a designer, unearthing all of this was actually very, very exciting. So seeing the same thing done so many times at such scale and knowing how it was really causing problems for our journalists and our users, that meant we had a really good problem to solve. And it was actually two problems. We had a lot of design sprawl and a lot of inefficiency. And the design team thought a lot about how to solve these problems in such a way that we wouldn't have the same ones again in another year. And we realized our focus had to be reusability. So we needed to take anything we were doing over and over and do one thing instead. And that meant we needed smarter modules. So for us, that meant modules that would either do the same job in different places, so for example, a promo that can live on a home page or an article, or to do the same job across use cases, so one promo that could support a video story as well as just a regular story. And we needed smarter styles, so that we wanted to be able to reuse them across these modules to keep everything cohesive and help fight design sprawl. So here's a very short version of how we got there. Based on our inventory, we distilled the needs of our site into module categories. So for us, as a new site, ours were promo, story, media, ads, a couple of others. Then we distilled all of our style needs into style ramps. So anything we used again and again, like type, color, spacers, we abstracted those into variables. And finally, we designed some documentation to help us stay organized. And for us, documentation was absolutely the key part of getting all of this to work. Because if there's one thing we learned from our inventory, it is that reusability does not happen by accident. So even if dev moved to a component-based approach, design still had a role in making sure those components actually met the right needs and actually fit together visually on the page. 
And we found that reusability only happens when we pay extremely careful attention to details and then write them down. So this was quite an adjustment for our team, because not everyone loves writing things down. But we have come to love what it does for us, which is to help us design things that are, in fact, reusable. And I'll share our version of design documentation in a moment. But first, I want to show you where we ended up. So here's our new story promo, which now has a real name. Promo Story Thumb Small, or P1 for short. And this was our single reusable module answer to the 12 different versions we had before. And this module can live on a small screen or a large screen. It can live in the main content well or in the side rail. It can promote a video story or a 360 video story. It can promote a story without an image, which is often the case for breaking news, or a story without a timestamp, which helps us showcase our best evergreen content. And it can live on a home page or an article page or search results or any other page we build in the future. And it is made entirely of reusable styles. So here you can see that everything in this module is pointing to one of our style variables, even the space between elements. And Josh is going to talk a little bit about that for a second. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, thanks. So we implemented this through the usual ways of styling Polymer applications and elements. A uh, custom mm -hmm. style element uh, for our theme and that had CSS custom properties, mix-ins, and some classes. Uh, this sample shows the colors and typography used in that promo, and also shows how we mirror some of the uh, mix-ins into classes so that we can use that in server-side HTML. We also built custom elements for some of the more complex design elements, like icons and buttons. Uh, and this example on the screen, which is like a little label header that goes above a lot of our list of promos. And now Marianne's going to keep talking to us about more, more about documentation. OK, thanks, Josh. <laughs> OK, back to our friend P1 here. Uh, a lot of attention to detail went into making this one module smart enough to be reused in so many ways. And that's where our documentation came in. So we wanted to keep documentation as minimal and lightweight as possible while also making sure we weren't missing anything. And one exciting thing we learned as we troubleshot that is that dev and design actually needed to know the same things. So we found that to make a module reusable, we all had to agree on the answers to five basic questions. What is it called? What is it made out of? What variants do we need? How does it scale? And what styles is it using? And here is a peek under the hood at our version of design documentation for that P1 module. So on the left, we have our functional spec, and on the right, our design spec, which we call our matrix, because it's a visual matrix of how this module can look. And together, these documents answer those five questions. So question one, what is it called? We never used to pay attention to this, but now anything we build gets a specific name, so we can keep track of it and reuse it. And we collaborated with Dev on a naming system, which includes three parts, a shorthand ID. So in this case, it's P1, and that just makes it easier to talk about things. Category ID, here it's promo, and a descriptive ID. So this is story thumb small, which tells us this has a small thumbnail image. Next question, what is it made out of? Here we established that this module has a headline plus some optional things, like labels, an image, and other nested modules, like a timestamp and an icon. Question three, what variants do we need? This is where we capture our module's use cases. So for the P1, we have our default display, then variants for no image, different media types, adver advertiser content, and a couple of others. Question four, how does it scale? So here we see we have a narrow version and a wide version, and the matrix tells us how these sit on the grid, as well as what the two sizes look like. And finally, our styles. We call out our style variables over here, and this helps us avoid those one-off styles we used to have so many of. So I hope you can see that for us, documentation is not an end in itself. It has really turned into a thinking tool for our teams to help all of us check our work for reusability. And over the past few months, we have used this method to build out an MVP set of modules for our new site, which launched to 100% last week. And here it is. Here is our new story page design. And we think it look, looks much cleaner and more on brand and much more trustworthy than the old one. And it's going to be much more predictable for our journalists and our readers. But what's even more beautiful to me about this new design is that we now have this kind of x-ray vision into it. So anyone on our team can look at this page and know exactly the modules that came together to build it. 
And this x-ray vision makes us so much more efficient than before. When we need to change something, which we know we will as we test things and get feedback and as our needs change, we can change it in one place instead of 12. And we can quickly build new pages by repurposing things we've already built. And the last thing I want to share with you all is that we've been beta testing this for a few months. And we can see that our readers are now spending significantly more time with us per visit on the new site. So while we love the new, the new design system, our readers loving it is what we care the most about. So we're really happy with that result. And we're excited to keep evolving all of this because it's brand new, it's a work in progress, and there's still a lot to learn. Um, but thank you so much. And Josiah is going to take it from here. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> Very good stuff. So building a team to build stuff. We've, so we've unified around a module-based decoupled web framework. We've established a shared design system that organizes our vision behind every component we build. But we, we need to think about how to structure a web development team around component-driven web development. Because I believe we're in the post-abstraction era of coding for the web. And as we unify as a team around a standards-based approach, element encapsulation, and heavy reusability, we need to structure our team for maximum efficiency and effectiveness. We've, we've all been building websites and web things the same way for a very long time now. But web components changes this work dynamic entirely. And because of that, it was time to think about a new kind of team organization. In our internal observation, we identified three coding styles that make up our team. The innovative artists, the disciplined scientists, and the very reliable craftsmen. And it's really important for us to understand how these different coding styles work together in order to build an effective team. And every style has its strength and weakness. No one's greater than the other. And some of us fall, don't really fall cleanly into one column or the next. But some projects may benefit from one style being more dominant than another style. For example, a banking application is very focused on being accurate and not time to market. While if you're working for an innovative startup, pushing that code out the door that's changing the world, it, we want to do that very, very quickly for our investors. A balanced, team, a balanced team can cover the weaknesses of one single type, but only when good communication and empathy-driven teamwork is applied. So let's learn a little bit more about these different coding styles. Let's take the artists, the adventurer, the innovator, the fast moving, the problem solver, always figuring out the problem, always finding a better way while cutting a few corners in there. I can identify with the artists the most. It's like tests. What are tests? I don't know. I don't know what a test is. You know, our, our weakness as our uh, unique solutions are great for pushing innovation and doing things better, but unique means it's harder for someone else to pick up and maintain code. How an artist would approach building the P1 modules, they, would, uh, they might say, oh, I'm going to use the new grid, uh, CSS grid framework, and that's how I'm going to uh, I'm gonna make this happen. But we already have a grid framework. And the, for the company, and we've just fragmented company standards. All of a sudden, someone else comes around to reuse it, and they're like, what did, what did you do with the CSS grid framework? So instead, artists need to innovate the right way by focusing on things to improve everyone's work workflow, uh, not just the current vertical that they're working in. The scientist pursues code as a discipline uh, to be mastered. They're focused on best practices, have very well-tested code, and this is really, really good, but it can all come at the cost of over-engineering solutions and slower time to market. And the scientists, they would approach that P1 promo module that Marianne showed us. They might look at it and say, oh, we need the, to use the image resizer for this image. Oh, eh, this image resizer, it's, it's really clunky to work with. It needs some refra refactoring. Or, oh, how we're fetching data over here for this P1, uh, it's, it's not very elegant. I think I'm going to rewrite it. And so all of a sudden, we've taken uh, a very small scope module and really, really extended the scope. 
But the positives are they're, we're, they're continuing to improve on a framework and plugging holes in framework and pieces of code. Carefully tested, disciplined, always seeking the industry, best industry standard practices. Slower time to market. Over-engineering. You don't know anyone like that, do you? <laughs> Maybe. The craftsmen, very, very important. Uh, these are often underlooked coding styles and people that you work with every day. They are the steady, dependable, delivering consistent on-time code that's very, very reliable. Sometimes they can lack innovation and deeper technical expertise. They might approach that P1 module like this. They're using two keyboards and Emacs. No, not really. Who uses Emacs? Uh, they, they might approach it, oh, I wrote 60% of this code last week, or code like it. I'm just going to copy my code, and I'm going to bring it over here, and I'm going to reuse all this code. Great. And that's awesome, because we're keeping on the company's standards. We're doing a lot of reusing. But not so good, because no one has stopped to think, hey, is there a better way to do what I'm doing? Is there a better way to solve this problem? And maybe copying the code that I used from last week is great, but if I'm copying code from a month ago, a lot of things can change in a month. Overall, the craftsman is a very, very important addition to the team, often overlooked by the other coding personalities. Now, adding web components in the mix on top of these styles, you know, web component development really resonates with each of these styles in different ways. The artists, they get to forge ahead on these, on, on these new best practices. They get to blaze a new trail because we've been building the th things the same way for a very long time. They get to go back to the drawing board. The scientists, well, they get their standards-based web development. You know, even though this is a very free solution, they get that encapsulation, they get clean, organized code, and the ability to test things logically. So the scientists, they love this. And the craftsmen, well, they get to use familiar tools and technologies that they already know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And Polymer has such a straightforward, simplified API, it's not like throwing a whole new abstracted web framework at a craftsman expecting them to learn a completely new API and framework. They get to use the tools that they already have. That's how Web Components resonates with each of these styles. So an important, we know and we understand these different styles a little better. So how do each of these styles work together? How do you balance a team with these styles? And we have to remember, and when you're working with a team with different style coders, we're all in this together. And we can either be building each other up or tearing each other down. And balance is really struck by the scientists bringing that structure, bringing the, hey, we need to harden this and test this to the artist. And the artist saying, hey, let's solve this problem that no one's been able to solve yet. Let's do it in, you know, with innovation. And he's bringing that to the craftsman, the scientist. And the craftsman is like, hey, reality check, everybody. We need to be on schedule. We have something to deliver. And we just got to go, go, go. So the other interesting thing is that this can also be applied to entire dev teams, as entire development teams sort of lean one way or the other. Uh, and how do you solve for team-to-team -team interaction? That's even harder than you know, just managing a team and figuring that out amongst the team. And it's through empathy. It's through clear communication. And it's through cooperation. So empathy, OK, you just threw out that word. Well, what does that really look like practically? Well, it's like a bunch of scientists on a team saying, I can't believe they don't have 100% code coverage in that project. And we do this all the time. And we, let's, so stop and let's empathize. What does empathy look like here? Well. Um, empathy, under, empathy and understanding says, well, maybe the team is focused on delivering something fast with imperfect code. Maybe that's what this particular team needs and is focused on right now. And then the artists, why aren't they using the absolute newest way to build things? Well, let's empathize. Maybe it's safer and easier to build on a proven industry standard for their project than going off the rails and building something else. Because what we want to do, we want to fight against extremes. And both the artists and the scientists, they can look at the craftsmen and say, oh, they're not real coders. They're not up at 3 o'clock in the morning contributing to open source repositories every night. 
but you know, they're, the, they're the bread and butter. They're the ones that are they're churning out all this work. And we have to fight against extremes. And we have to remember to empathize or else craftsmen will get imposter syndrome and the walls of hubris and ego will be built up with scientists and with artists. So now Josh is going to talk about how we've structured our web component developer experience specifically. Josh. Thanks. So we put this into practice on our dev team in a few ways. The first is focusing on the API over the element implementation. Because there will always be times when you must compromise on code quality, where speed to market is just more valuable to the business than having the absolute most rock, hard, rock solid code ever. Uh, so what that means is like focusing on the, reviewing the API, which is the names, the properties, and public methods of an element. The implementation of all those things can be refactored later very safely without having to worry about anybody breaking anybody else's code. The way we actually make sure that that refactoring actually happens on our team is we have a program we call Adopt a Module. And that means we just bake in some time to every sprint where we allow developers to go back and review modules that have been maybe sitting around for a while that we haven't touched and clean up documentation, clean up some JavaScript that might be a little messy, maybe some styles aren't uh, implemented as cleanly as possible. And that lets us kind of get code out to market quickly, but still come back and make sure we are having really good code that will be maintainable and long lasting. So what that looks like in practice is this is a really sam simple sample element and showing a good API with some bad code. So you see there's this horrible little string function that's filtering out spaces for some reason. But it's got a nice name for the element. It's got a good property title. And all the bad stuff can be refactored out later. On the flip side, you've got a bad API good code module, which is got a really nice implementation for the filtering. It's just much cleaner. It's got some error checking. Uh, but there's a problem with it. There's a misspelling in the title change handler. And you can't go back and fix that, because if somebody else is already using that, you can't fix that spelling. And the property is just called t. So now all the elements that are set t equals whatever, they're going to have to change that. And then the element name is not even that great. So this is an even bigger problem when you're dealing with other teams uh, using your code. And it's the biggest problem when you're actually open sourcing your code and the rest of the world is using your stuff. You don't want to be breaking their applications because you got a little sloppy at the start. So to get this focus, we uh, kind of build things backwards. Uh, we call it demo-driven development. We start by building examples of how the code will be used, how the element will be used. And this is pretty easy because we, of the spec documents we have. They list out all the different variants that design has told us that we should account for. And so we can show what each of those look like and think about how the element will be used to build out each of those things. Once we have that solid and we like it, uh, then we actually build out the element's implementation. And then finally, we'll come through and add tests and make it production ready. So what this looks like for our promo module is uh, listing out stuff like the normal variants, the version with no, no image, a version for video, ver version for galleries. And all of this lives in a demo file that's right next to the element. And it gets served through our custom dev server. So as you're developing your element, you can be testing on this, this demo page. And as you build out the implementation, things start to come to life. And when the whole page is working, you know you're done. And you're ready to start building those tests. So the last thing that we get from web components is division of labor. And what's nice is you can break out who works on which element based on their skill set. So if you've got an element that you say, well, we're really not sure how to build this thing out very well, so let's give that to our artists, because they're going to be able to come up with an interesting solution for this. If you've got an element that's really complicated and you need someone who's going to really put a lot of tests behind it, and that, get that one to the scientist. And then if you've got an element that you know exactly how you want to build it, but you just need it to be built on time and get it out at the right moment, give that to your craftsman. And then the great thing is you can always come back and have the other style do the refactoring later. And so the, the scientist can come in and clean up the artist's code and add some more tests. Or the artist could come in and say, oh, craftsman, you could have built this a little bit better. And so if you get that kind of interaction, it's great. So we hope this glimpse into how we build things will help you build great things with Polymer as well. Thanks for having us here, and have a great rest of the conference.